Welcome to the America First Policy Institute Weekly Rundown, where we bring you highlights from our policy experts' media appearances. Each week, we address the nation's pressing issues, guided by policies that put America first. Our first expert, Chad Wolf, appeared on Fox Business to discuss the impact of sanctuary city policies and the incoming administration's approach to enforcing federal immigration laws. Chad explains the effectiveness of enforcing immigration laws within local jails to enhance public safety. Well, I think this is obviously a win for the incoming Trump administration. And I think what this validates is the ability for ICE to do their job to remove individuals, bad individuals from the country, regardless of what local jurisdictions may or may not do to help them do that. It's federal immigration law and they have the ability to execute on that law. So it's a good ruling for them. How long before the concept of the migrant sanctuary is just out of bounds. I, I, I think the whole sanctuary idea yeah. is just losing steam. I think it's nearing its end. What say you? Well, I think you're right, Stuart. I think what you see in, in places like New York, right, you got Mayor Adams saying, look, he wants to sit down with Tom yeah. Homan and talk about how they can work together to remove dangerous individuals from their city streets. And I think once uh, you know, you've got blue city mayors that start to understand what is going on here and how those Illegal aliens that are Richard continue Lawson, to commit those crimes and AFP, put their yeah. community at danger, uh, and how ICE can help them, I think they'll start to uh, they'll start to come around. But uh, I agree with you. I think the the public sentiment on sanctuary city jurisdictions has has turned over these last six to eight months. Next, Michael Falconder addressed the Biden administration's policies and the incoming administration's plan to leverage tariffs to combat the fentanyl. Michael connects economic policies like tariffs to addressing critical national issues like drug enforcement. You know, if you look at why President Trump is saying that we need to implement tariffs immediately upon him coming into office, it's because we still have about 100,000 fentanyl deaths per year. And that is almost entirely able to be stopped if only the the, uh, Mexican government in particular would take on some of the drug cartels south of our border. And so by threatening tariffs, President Trump is, th- is hoping to get the same kind of outcome from the Mexican government that he did on Remain in Mexico. Mm. So if we go back to, you know, the 2018-2019 the time frame, he said, if the Mexican government does not step up and do something about these caravans that are coming from Central America into our country through a porous border, then that the president was going to slap tariffs on the Mexican government. And not surprisingly, they did something about it. They deployed their own troops to the border. And so what President Trump recognizes is that curbing fentanyl deaths, curbing the amount of illegal drugs coming into this country is within the realm of possibility of the Mexican government doing something about it. And if they don't do it, then he's going to impose some penalties on them through tariffs. Richard Lawson, a senior legal expert at AFPI, discussed the impact of small dollar donations on campaign financing and the ongoing investigation into fraudulent contributions. Richard highlights the legal framework for uncovering potential campaign finance abuses and the importance of transparency. We should point out one of the things that's really interesting about this case is under Wisconsin law, you can, you can, uh, Mr. Block individually uh, can sue under a RICO theory. I should point out our lawsuit is technically against a John Doe. We do not know who is using this information. What happened a couple of weeks ago is we had sent a subpoena to Act Blue for some data. They filed a motion to quash the subpoena, and uh, the judge had a hearing on it, and he basically said, no, you're going to have to, told Act Blue, they're going to have to provide key data that is going to allow us to you know, follow the money. Uh, one of my favorite shows, of course, is The, the Wire, and uh, you know, they, as they point out there, you follow the money, you don't know where that's going to wind up. Uh, yeah. You throw it overseas, it could be something domestic. You know, yeah. one thing that is really fascinating that we have come to discover in the course of this case is small dollar donations have ridiculously outsized uh, impact in, 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 in donation rates. So I, just yeah. one quick example and some statistics here. In Wisconsin, the top 0.1% of true small dollar donors, you know, one to five dollars this year, that top 0.1, not 1%, 0.1%. Yeah was responsible for 10% of all the numerical donations and 10% of all of the money coming in Wisconsin. It's an extraordinary number of uh, donations. And you mentioned 300. Mark's donations, the people using the identity, it shot up to 500 in just a six-month period of time, which places that well within that 0.1%. 
Fred Flights analyzed the political instability in South Korea and its implications for U.S. strategic partnerships in the region. Fred discussed how instability in South Korea affects regional security and American foreign policy. Well, the, the South Korean president has the authority to declare martial law in cases of national emergency. But what seems to have happened here is that the parliament won an overwhelming majority uh, last spring and has been using its power to indict and to impeach members of the UN government and to investigate his family, including his wife. This is not unusual for South Korean politics. And it's also not unusual for former presidents to be indicted in jail. And, and it's also not unusual for presidents to abuse martial law authority. So the mm -hmm. parliament threw this out. The question now is whether the military and security forces will honor this decision by the parliament. It looks like you doesn't want them to, but we don't know what security forces and the military will do. Right. And that's sort of the tension in the next few hours. You've got Joe Biden in Angola. Uh, he says he's getting briefed on the situation. Um, well, what part of this, too, is the concern of how China may react as well? And uh, what role North Korea is playing here as part of some intelligence operation? Well, the political disarray in, in, in South Korea uh, is not good for regional security. It, it's harder for the U.S. and for Japan to cooperate with South Korea if the government is in turmoil, and it is in turmoil right now. And if if this mm -hmm. if this uh, martial law order falls through, and I think it will, Yoon is certainly going to be impeached, probably will be in jail, and I don't know who will take over for him. General Keith Kellogg, nominee for special envoy to Russia and Ukraine, emphasized the need for leveraging diplomacy to end the war in Ukraine. General Kellogg discusses the strategic use of leverage in negotiations and the importance of ending the prolonged conflict. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, in a way, it's really pretty good for the president elect because it gives him leverage. He can make the decision on what he wants to do. And the more that the Biden administration does this, it creates a, a greater opportunity for the president elect to do what he wants to do. And again, he understands leverage probably better than anybody based on his business experience. But, you know, go, go back to September when Zelensky came to Trump Tower and he went up there and then he and the president spoke and they were mm -hmm. talking about after a thousand days of war, they're signaling it's time for this war to end because the president said very clearly and said, quote, it is time. And he, he's right about that. This war has gone on for over a thousand days. It's expanded. It's now global in nature. When I mean global in nature, when, when, when you look at what's happened, you've got the North Koreans involved by providing troops. You've got the Iranians involved. You've got the Chinese involved and you've got the Russians involved. So the, the makeup of the war has expanded. And it's time we kind of put it back in a box not only for American security, but for global security as well. So I, I don't have a problem with what they've done. It's all based on leverage. The president understands that and is going to use it to his advantage. That wraps up this week's America First Policy Institute Weekly Rundown. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you found these insights from our policy experts valuable. Let us know your thoughts and feedback in the comment section below. And don't forget to like and share this video. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you never miss an important update on the America First agenda. For more information on our policies and initiatives, visit AmericaFirstPolicy.com.